Delirium, it is defined by DSM-5 criteria as a short-term impairment in attention and awareness that is associated with additional cognitive deficits. It is characterized by an alteration of attention, consciousness, and cognition, with a reduced ability to focus, sustain or shift attention. It develops over a short period of time and fluctuates during the day. Clinically, the disorder is often characterized by psychomotor behavioral disturbances, such as hyperactivity or hypoactivity, and sleep disturbances. There are three subtypes of delirium, depending on the psychomotor behavior. Hyperactive delirium, hypoactive delirium, and mixed delirium. First, hyperactive delirium. Hyperactive ICU delirium accounts for approximately 23% of cases. This condition is characterized by agitation, restlessness, emotional instability, and positive psychotic features such as hallucinations and illusions that interfere with treatment. New onset psychotic symptoms in older adults are unlikely to be a primary mental illness, and they should be investigated for pharmacological or physiological causes. Next, hypoactive delirium. A typical characteristic of hypoactive delirium is confusion, sedation, apathy, slowed motor function, withdrawal, lethargy, and drowsiness. Hypoactive delirium is often underrated and is associated with a worse prognosis, as patients with hypoactive delirium showed higher six-month mortality rates than those with other subtypes of delirium. Lastly, mixed delirium. Mixed delirium is the most frequent type, accounting for about half of the total cases. A combination of the two forms previously described, this condition manifests as a fluctuation between hypoactive and hyperactive behavior. Now, I need you to remember an interesting mnemonic, delirium. D for drugs, E for eyes, ears, and other sensory deficits, L for low O2 states such as heart attack, stroke, and pulmonary embolism. I for infection, R for retention of urine or stool, I for rectal state. U for underhydrogen or undernutrition, and M for metabolic causes, example, diabetes, sodium abnormalities. Sounds good, these are all factors that are clinically essential for ICU delirium. As yet, the pathophysiology of delirium is not fully understood and is based on many hypotheses. Among them, dysregulation of neurotransmitters makes the most sense. Here, over time, the amount of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, also known as happy hormone, is increased abnormally, and there will be a decreased level of acetylcholine. There is also involvement of other neurotransmitters such as glutamate, gamma-aminobutyric acid, serotonin, and endorphins. During a critical illness, inflammatory indicators such as cytokines, chemokines, and tumor necrosis factor alpha trigger a chain of events that leads to microvascular impairment, thrombin generation, and endothelial damage. Because of the production of microaggregates of fibrin, platelets, neutrophils, and red blood cells in the cerebral microvasculature, inflammation can cause brain dysfunction by decreasing cerebral blood flow. There are also some other mechanisms like neuroinflammation with microglial activation, oxidative stress, neuronal aging, and sleep-wake cycle dysfunction, etc. The Confusion Assessment Method ICU and the Intensive Care Delirium Screening Checklist are both extensively validated and used for delirium diagnosis and evaluation of delirium over time. They allow the assessment of attention, orientation, and memory. In CAMICU, the level of consciousness is evaluated through a standardized sedation scale such as the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale or RASS Scale, which we have discussed in detail in the previous chapter. Through the ICDSC, the level of consciousness is firstly evaluated on a five-point scale, A, to E, which ranges from unresponsive, A, to exaggerated response, E. We have provided both scales in the description below, please check it out later. In addition to the tools for ICU delirium, a careful clinical assessment must be performed. For instance, it is mandatory to perform frequent vitals and or neurochecks. Patients having a prolonged stay in ICU or similar environments are vulnerable to ICU delirium. Sounds like a psychological illness, indeed it is. But, is it a threat? Then I read an article on BBC, ICU delirium, quote, a real danger. And I found some amazing facts. First of all, it's not that real and can be easily prevented, so invented the anti-ICU delirium campaign and published it on a reputed site, called Facebook.
So today, I am going to discuss this AIDC as I have given it a nomenclature with you. AIDC is based on a common management protocol to follow in cases of ICU delirium, either due to prolonged stay in the hospital or a similar environment. It is a mnemonic, where A stand for antipsychotics, I for infection control, D for differential diagnosis assessment, and lastly, C stands for choice of sedatives and analgesia. That's it. Patients with delirium have a more extended hospital stay, and six months survival is lower than the patients without delirium. Delirium can lead to long-term cognitive impairment in patients who survive a critical illness, and lastly, prevention of delirium is imperative. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and support us to learn more, thank you.